Uh, as you know, this is our medical education series. It's known as Med Ed. We're in our fall semester. Tonight is the fourth of five talks. Uh, the talk tonight, as you know, is on atrial fibrillation, what's new with AFib. Uh, just a reminder for next week, if anybody is interested, we have below the belt an integrative approach to abdominal complaints. So our venue is the library. As you know, we start at 7, we finish at 8. Uh, this is a collaborative effort between the Darien Library and Stanford Hospital Physician Relations. So we thank the library for hosting us throughout the whole series. My name is Josh Herbert. I'm the program director. I'm a primary care doctor with the Stanford Health Medical Group. Uh, I lead this series. This is, as I said, the fourth time, fourth series uh, that we've done. And we've got a great crowd tonight, so thank you all for coming. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Sandhya Dhruvakumar, who received her undergraduate Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry with honors from Brown University, graduating magna cum laude. She received her medical degree from the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. After graduation from medical school, completed a residency in internal medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. She continued her training in cardiology and electrophysiology in a fellowship at New York Presbyterian Hospital while Cornell then additionally went on to complete uh, a fellowship in electrophysiology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Dhruva Kumar is the current director of electrophysiology at, uh, in the Department of Cardiology at Stanford Hospital and as, as with just about all of our speakers is recognized locally and nationally as a top doc, and we are fortunate to have her here this evening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dhruva Kumar. All right, thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you all for coming tonight um, to hear about atrial fibrillation. So um, I really wanted to focus my talk specifically on atrial fibrillation and particularly about the newer developments um, in atrial fibrillation. So before I start with what's new and cutting edge with AFib, I'd like to really back, go back to the basics, which is I'm always surprised at how many people come into my office who've had atrial fibrillation, sometimes for decades, but don't really understand what it is. So I like to start by explaining what is atrial fibrillation. So it is an irregular and sometimes rapid heart rhythm. We identify it primarily on an EKG. And this is a, a pointer. So this is a strip, a rhythm strip, which shows an, a single lead of an EKG. And these spikes are the bottom part of your heart beating. The, here you see continuous sort of wavy activity. That's the top part of the heart beating. But it's the irregularity of those spikes that show us that we have atrial fibrillation. So. Mm -hmm. Was that particular diagram showing the condition or was that abnormal? That was, the, uh, that was irregular. So that was an abnormal. Those spikes aren't evenly spaced apart. Some of them are closer than together than others, and so that irregularity is um, characteristic of atrial fibrillation. So this is my diagram to explain how electricity flows in your heart. So I find that as an electrophysiologist, that A, most people have no idea what I do and have never heard of me, and B, that much, people are much more familiar with other aspects of the way the heart works. They have a basic understanding about blockages in the arteries, they know that you can have bypass surgery or stents, they've heard of valve replacements, but most people don't always understand how the electrical part of your heart works, and that's my specialty. So under no normal circumstances, this is how your heart beats. This is a diagram of your heart. Your heart has four compartments, as you may be aware of. Your heart essentially is a pump that circulates blood through your body and lungs. There are two chambers in the top part of the heart. Those serve to collect blood as it comes in from the body and lungs. The two chambers on the bottom are larger. Those are the pumping portion of the muscle. 
So the way the heart works um, and in review is that the right side of your heart is a unit that collects blood from your body and delivers it to your lungs to get oxygen. And then the left side of your heart is a unit that collects that lung back from the blood back from the lungs and then pumps it to your body to get used. So the way the electricity works, and I always say you can have the best pump in the world, but if you don't plug it in, it won't do anything. So your heart needs electricity as well. So the electrical system starts here in the top of the right compartment in an area called the sinus node. The sinus node is responsible for creating each heartbeat and it does so automatically. It's plugged into the rest of your body so it knows when you've been exercising or sleeping so it can crank up the rate or slow it down based on what your needs are. But once it creates a heartbeat, that electrical impulse actually spreads through the walls of the top chambers of the heart and that's what makes it squeeze. That's the impulse that tells the muscle to squeeze. Then typically there's only one way for the electricity to get from the top of the heart to pass to the bottom part of the heart and that's this area called the AV node. So those specialized cells conduct the electricity down to the bottom part of the heart where it splits into two major networks called the right bundle and the left bundle. And eventually the electricity gets to all the muscle in the bottom part of the heart and the major pumping portion of the heart squeezes. So that's what, that's what causes that characteristic lumped up. The top squeezes and then the electricity gets to the bottom and it squeezes. So that's under normal circumstances. What happens when you have atrial fibrillation? So this is the mechanism that drives that EKG that I showed you before. When you have atrial fibrillation, the top part of your heart is an electrical storm. So there's multiple little wave fronts of electricity, basically rapidly circulating, reforming, terminating, all happening inside your heart. It's an electrical chaotic storm. Under normal circumstances, the top part of your heart goes between 60 and 100 beats per minute. So if you were to sit here at rest and check your pulse, for most of us it would be somewhere between 60 and 100, or if you look at population studies, maybe 50 to 90 beats per minute. But the top part of your heart when you're in atrial fibrillation goes at about 300 to 350 beats per minute. There's so much rapid electricity storming through. Because that happens, the top part of the heart basically just quivers. There's too much electricity for it to squeeze and relax and squeeze and relax. It's just shivering with the amount of electricity in there. So it's not really shuttling the blood down to the ventricles as it normally does. Um, and as you can imagine, the bottom part of the heart is getting bombarded with all that electrical signal. And it normally just passively conduct, you receive the electricity as it comes down. So the electrical impulses on your EKG, which show when the bottom part of your heartbeat become erratic because there's no rhythm to rhyme or rhythm to when the electrical impulses hit it, and much more rapid than usual. So this is the number one reason we worry about atrial fibrillation. It's because those atrium, the top chambers, are not squeezing properly, and in doing so, the blood collects and pools in those chambers. And that essentially is how blood clots form. That static blood just sits and aggregates and it clots. If that blood clot were to remain in your heart, it would not cause a problem, but it won't necessarily. It can break free and get into the circulation as it turns out, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. The straight shot from your heart when it gets into your circulation, go straight to your brain. So these blood clots, once they get to your circulation, have the highest propensity to go to the brain. It will plug up circulation there and cause essentially damage or death to a portion of the brain tissue that it hits at random. So this is our number one concern with atrial fibrillation. We know that atrial fibrillation becomes more prevalent the older you get. So this is a chart looking at patients in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. The orange bar is how common AFib is, and this has actually gone up over time, so this data is not quite accurate. But at this point, by the time people get to their 80s, about 10 to 15 percent of people have atrial fibrillation. So that gets to be a pretty common occurrence. It's a common disease. 
Um, when people are in their 40s and 50s, only 1% of the population has AFib. It's less current. So as we age, as our heart ages, the atrial fibrillation becomes more common. The blue bar here in our graph shows what percentage of strokes at every age are caused by AFib. What we see is that goes up with time as well. So by the time people get into their 80s, about a quarter of all strokes are caused by AFib. You mentioned, and I see the date here, 1991, so maybe this data is, is 25 years old. So what are some of the external factors that cause the frequency of AFib in the general population to go up in the past 25 years? That's a good question. I have a slide to address that. So we consider this to be, because of its frequency, and almost epidemic in proportion. Um, what you see here is essentially a graph of how many patients, and this is over time, this is projecting out to 2050, of how many people will have AFib. And the projections are between 12 million and 16 million people will have atrial fibrillation at that time. The other thing you might notice about this curve is it's not linear. We're not just seeing an increase, we're seeing that it's going up proportionately. So we think that, and we'll get to some of the conditions that drive AFib besides age, we think that this increase in people having AFib is partly related to the aging of the population, but some of the other medical conditions that we see drive AFib. So what are the risk factors for AFib? Age, as I've mentioned, which obviously, you know, we can't do much about. It's, it's a good thing to age. Um, obesity, and this is probably something else that really drives that our, our population is getting more obese overall, and we know that obesity directly affects the risk for atrial fibrillation. High blood pressure. Sleep apnea. So um, sleep apnea, just as an aside, not everybody is always aware of what sleep apnea is. It's a sleep, very common sleep-related disorder. Um, it's not insomnia, which I find a lot of patients confuse it with. It's not that you have a perception necessarily that you're getting a poor night's sleep. But when you sleep, you can actually have episodes where you have interruptions in your breathing. They're typically so short, they're called apneic episodes. They're typically so short that you're not aware that you woke up. And so people will often have the perception that they've been asleep the whole night, but they wake up hundreds of times. Um, all of which, and all those times are associated with a decrease in oxygen. So with sleep apnea, some of the signs can be that people snore, that people snore and they have a funny pattern of breathing when they snore, and people, a lot of patients will say, or their loved ones will say, that they will often sound like they stop breathing for a second and then take another big breath to follow. Um, being very sleepy during the daytime or being very tired during the daytime is a common symptom of sleep apnea, um, as is sort of the tendency to, in this kind of situation, for example, drift off to sleep as soon as the lights get dim or a movie goes on. Um, and so it's, it's a big, it's common, it's a big driver for atrial fibrillation, and as it turns out, these are some of the symptoms, but the only way that you know is to get tested. So if we see patients with um, AFib, we will screen for this, and we will refer people for testing if we think it's appropriate. Um, other types of heart disease, so if you've had a stent or a valve surgery or anything else that's wrong with your heart, those changes can promote atrial fibrillation by disrupting the electricity as well. Alcohol consumption, so anything more than a drink a night can increase your risk of atrial fibrillation. We know that alcohol has some direct electrical properties on the heart. And in fact, there's a condition called the holiday heart where we can see people who are very young and don't have a tendency for AFib who go and binge drink, think your typical college student, and can show up in the emergency room with an episode of atrial fibrillation decades before we would normally expect it just based on the effects of alcohol on the heart. Um, thyroid disease. So having a hyperactive or hypoactive, underactive thyroid can increase the risk for atrial fibrillation. Um, interestingly, endurance exercise is a risk factor. So marathon runners, triathletes, um, patients who have, um, who exercise um, very intense cardio for more than 45 minutes to an hour a day can have an increased risk because the athlete's heart is different from a regular heart. It changes in ways that 
help people exercise, but can also alter the electricity. So how do we diagnose the problem? Well, the simplest way is to get an EKG in the office or an emergency room. Um, the limitation of an EKG is that it captures exactly 10 seconds of electrical activity in your heart. And so if you're not having it then, we won't be able to see it. There's, it just le leaves no traces. Um, if you're admitted to the hospital with symptoms, you may wear a telemetry monitor, those wires that continuously record your electricity, we may catch it there. Um, if you're an outpatient and we're suspicious, we can do a 24 or 48 hour continuous monitor to look for atrial fibrillation. Um, if that's not sufficient, we have two to four a week outpatient continuous monitors that we can put on patients to screen. Um, and if that's not okay, if that's not adequate, and we know that for certain conditions it's not, we have patients who occasionally have symptoms every six months, well it's unlikely that a four week monitor would catch those symptoms. Or we have patients who we look for um, AFib for other reasons. In those patients we can actually do small injectable cardiac monitors. They're long-term monitors. They're the size of a couple of matchsticks put together. And they get, basically, we, it's, it's a five-minute procedure. We numb up the skin over your chest. We make a very small local incision, and we inject this under the skin. The device is wireless, um, auto-detecting for arrhythmias, and has a three-year battery life. So it's really valuable for us to make diagnoses with very intensive screening. Um, I've added this in, our re in my recent talks because I've noticed that more and more patients tell me that they suspect that they're in atrial fibrillation. How? Well, they're blood pressure cuffs. It turns out a lot of blood pressure cuffs have little irregularity monitors or it can actually alert people that they think AFib is happening. So I've had patients self refer because their blood pressure cuff told them something was wrong. Um, I've had people come because they notice that at the exercise machine at the gym, their pulse is now 170 when they do that, you know, stint on the elliptical where it used to be 120 or 130. Um, more patients wear smartwatches or Fitbits, and these devices are getting more sophisticated and can tell us not only when the pulse is elevated, when the pulse is irregular. And there's apparently the next generation of the Apple Watch will have an AFib detection algorithm within it. Um, people can use apps on their phone, so for those of you who have smartphones, the camera function of your phone can function as a basic pulse oximeter. By, so you put your finger to the light and it will check how many beats per minute you have, and there are apps on the phone to do that. So again, patients can sometimes tell us when they're having AFib. So um, talking about screening with these long-term monitors, we now really do intensive patient um, screening when people show up with stroke. As you know, AFib causes stroke. So sometimes we work backwards when we find a patient with stroke but has never been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. So we know that if no other cause for that stroke has been found, that up to 30% of those patients have atrial fibrillation that was just not detected. So the longer we screen, the more AFib we tend to find. And our practice, based on the current evidence, is to offer all of these patients long-term implantable monitors. So we work with the stroke neurologists at our hospital, and if you present, if somebody presents to the hospital with a stroke that has no clear-cut cause, it used to be that we would say, well, you know, Mr. Jones, we checked you for two days and you had no AFib, so we don't think that's the cause. It turns out that's not long enough to monitor. So then they started doing those two to four week monitors and they found another 10, 15% of people would have AFib during that period of time. But it turns out the longer we look, the more AFib we find. And treating that will make a difference in terms of preventing future strokes. Um, a lot of this talk is sort of framed in questions that I get a lot in the office, so. Um, this is a frequent one. Is all AFib the same? Um, and so we actually do categorize atrial fibrillation into sort of different um, groups. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation means when the episodes start and stop on their own spontaneously. Though that could be every day, that could be once a year. But if they stop and start on their own, we call that paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Um, persistent atrial fibrillation means that the episode will continue indefinitely unless it's stopped with a shock or medication or something that intervenes. And long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation is that subcategory where 
the AFib has been continuous and in place for more than a year. We know that changes the heart in a different way, and that's long-term, uh, long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. Um, and these categories have an arrow between them because that is the progression for atrial fibrillation in everybody. It starts off as coming and going. Um, it turns into something that's persistent and eventually unperturbed. It will be um, indefinite. That progression could take 30 years. It could take six months. It's very unique from person to person. But left to its own devices, the AFib will always increase in frequency and duration um, and until it becomes one long continuous episode. Why is that? Well, there is a concept in, in my world that AFib begets AFib. And what that means is that AFib will electrically and structurally, as it turns out, alter your heart to make itself dominant. So every episode builds on each other. It's, my analogy is if you have, you know, if you leave some weeds left in your lawn and you just leave them to your own devices, they propagate. And so AFib, every episode that you have does change your heart to make itself more likely to occur, which is why it always tends to increase over time. Um, so it structurally alters your heart as well. Um, it does so by actually stretching or dilating those top chambers of the heart, the atria. It creates fibrosis, which is microscopic scarring of the muscular tissue, which interferes with the electricity and makes your AFib more likely to happen. Um, this is a um, this is just a slide that shows that in normal a patient in normal rhythm who has five percent of their heart is fibrotic or scarred, and somebody who's in occasional AFib and it often goes up to about this range, fifteen percent, and in people with chronic atrial fibrillation, there's a big change in the way that this muscle tissue looks under a microscope, and with a significant more amount of scar tissue present. So. The concerns with atrial fibrillation that we have are that it can increase your heart rate. As I mentioned, there's an excess of electricity happening in your heart, and that speeds it up. Um, the risk of blood clots and strokes. Um, and symptoms. So there are, if the heart rate is controlled in a patient with medications, if we've, um, well, as we talked about how we mitigate the risk of stroke, but if we've treated your risk of stroke by a blood thinner or a device, um, and that, then the last concern that we really have is symptoms. Um, because it's not really sufficient to say, I'm so sorry, you're miserable, but you're not going to die and you're not going to have a stroke. Um, we want to know that you have symptoms and we want to fix it if the symptoms are present. So what are the major symptoms? As it turns out, fatigue is the number one symptom. People always think it's going to be palpitations. It turns out not to be. Fatigue is nonspecific, but yet the most common symptom of atrial fibrillation. Palpitations can happen, and palpitation is really just the awareness of your heart beating, where normally we sit here and we don't think about our heart beating, so if you can feel it and it's, it's racing or irregular or thumping, that, that's what we would call palpitations. Shortness of breath. Um, I have seen AFib many a time be mistaken by patients for anxiety attacks, um, although when I ask patients, were you anxious at the time the episode happened, they're like, no. But it feels so much like an anxiety attack to patients because they, their heart races, they get short of breath. It really simulates physically a lot of what people expect to feel with an anxiety attack, and then it makes you anxious when it happens, that it's, um, it's a common mimicker. Swollen legs, and that's from the backup of fluid because the pump isn't pumping as well or as efficiently as it normally does. Dizziness or lightheadedness. Or, in about 50% of people, they don't feel it at all. They have no symptoms at all with the atrial fibrillation. Um, so this slide is really addressing more, not your risk of AFib, which we talked about, those specific risk factors which can um, increase your chances of having AFib. But this is really to understand your individual risk of stroke once you've been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. So, um, and we'll get into this, I think, in later slides, but I find that there's a very common misperception amongst patients and sometimes clinicians alike that the stroke risk is predicated on the amount of AFib you have and how frequently it occurs. It turns out that the AFib 
doesn't care. The risk of stroke doesn't hinge on either of those things. You can have AFib once every three years, or you can have AFib continuously for the last 10. And it turns out your stroke risk is pretty much the same. So the frequency of the episodes and the duration of the episodes don't impact any given individual's risk for a blood clot or for stroke. What does is the, their underlying individual patient characteristics. So this is a scoring system that's been developed and population validated to try to predict as best as we can minus the crystal ball what any given individual's risk of stroke is and try to make a good decision on how to prevent a stroke based on this. And so it's a nine point scoring system. You get a point for, and they, it's called the Chad's Two Basque. But essentially you get a point for being a woman, which isn't fair, but it does, but it's true. You get a, a point for being 65. You get another point for being 75, because age is a graded risk. You get a point for having um, diabetes, a point for having high blood pressure, a point for having congestive heart failure, which is when your heart backs up fluid, a point um, for having any other kind of vascular disease, stents, blockages in the arteries, blockages in the neck, any kind of arterial disease. And um, lastly, two points for a mini stroke, a TIA, or an actual stroke that's been proven. So that's sort of the nine point scoring system. Um, any score of two or more means that your risk of stroke is high enough that you need some kind of prevention. If it's one, it kind of depends on how strong that one particular risk factor is. And if it's zero, even with AFib, we think that your risk of forming a blood clot is so low that you don't necessarily need any treatment with it. Um, so for a score of two, the annual risk of stroke com competes up to about 2.4% annually, which doesn't sound that bad, but it's a cumulative risk. And that means it adds year over year. So if you have a two and change percent risk of stroke annually, that means over the 10 year horizon, that will be a 20% risk of stroke. Or if your risk is 4% annually, it means over a 10 year horizon, your risk of stroke will be a 40% risk. So that starts to build up to big numbers and that's where we really want to intervene and make a difference to prevent that. Um, and this is the, this is sort of by, um, by the actual score what your risk of stroke is. Once you get over five or six, your risk of stroke is well over 10% a year. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of people will ask, what if I only had it once? I only had it once five years ago, it was right after knee surgery. That doesn't count, it does count. There are very few one-time causes for AFib. Um, mostly those one-time causes revolve around if you've just had open heart surgery, you get a pass because your heart just got irritated. Outside of that, almost every other cause is considered to be not a one-time cause. We will expect to see it at some point again during your lifetime. So if you've had it once, you have it. Um, as I mentioned, studies show no difference in stroke risk between people with occasional AFib versus constant AFib. Um, recent data looked at the risk of silent strokes, people who aren't aware that they had a stroke, but had an MRI or a CAT scan that showed that part of their brain had been damaged. Um, and they found that <clears throat> um, there was no difference, again, and they know that people with AFib had more silent strokes than people without, and in the patient population with AFib, it didn't make a difference how much AFib you had. That risk was elevated. Um, and not surprisingly, similar data exist with a risk of cognitive dysfunction. So um, Alzheimer's, not specifically Alzheimer's, but cognitive decline. The thought is that when you have atrial fibrillation, even if you don't have a giant blood clot that goes and causes a really noticeable stroke, that you may have a risk for smaller blood clots that kind of gum up the works and create cognitive decline um, earlier than maybe uh, you would get it otherwise. So these are the things that we really want to prevent. How do we do that? Typically we do that with anticoagulation medications, which are also known as blood thinners. Um, the most, the oldest one we have is called warfarin or coumadin. It is tried and true. We know everything there is to know about it, having used it for 70 plus years at this point. Um, it needs frequent blood checks because the, the medication interacts with virtually everything. Um, tons of medications interact with it. Lots of things that you eat in your diet interact with it. And because of that, because it's metabolized in your liver through a very common central pathway that interferes with, that a lot of other things metabolize through, 
it interacts with stuff. So the levels constantly go up and down and it requires frequent blood checking as a result to keep you in the right range of blood thinness. So we need varying doses, as I mentioned, to achieve the proper effect. And about 40% of the time, even with really meticulous care, the blood is either too thin, which increases your risk of bleeding without any actual benefit to you in terms of stroke prevention, or it's too thick, which means it's not you're taking the medication and it's not protecting you the way it's supposed to. So those are the limitations for why Coumadin, um, also known as Warfarin, are just, it's not the most popular medication out there. And I say that um, as a significant uh, understatement. <laughs> So enter on the market eight to nine years ago, da, 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 the newer blood thinners. Um, now they are, you know, they were heralded as something that was going to really change blood, you know, medications um, and compliance. And it really has in a lot of ways, I will give it credit. These newer medications are designed to work through a different pathway. So they do not interfere with most of the medications that you take. They do not interfere with anything that you eat. Um, and they do not require any blood testing. Just like aspirin, you take it, and you can kind of be assured as to what, you know, its effect from person to person is so uniform, there's no testing required. Um, Prodexa was the first one on the market, followed by Xarelto, Eliquis, and the newest one is the Cevesa. Um, the biggest draw is that it is much more convenient. You just take the medication and you don't need to dose adjust or get frequent blood work done. Um, one of the concerns that some patients have are that it, the medication has no antidote. Coumadin does. The antidote for Coumadin is vitamin K. Um, so if you take a diet dose of vitamin K, it will reverse the effect of the Coumadin in your body. Um, these newer medications are on the verge. They're developing. They have developed a antidote for them, which is somewhere in clinical testing still. So eventually that will be, uh, will be an issue. But for right now, people, except for Pradaxa, none of the others have a reversal agent on the market. So some people worry about the risk of bleeding. For me, that's not the biggest concern, mostly because these clinical trials, which tested you know, up to 20,000 patients, showed that even these medications that don't have reversal agents don't really increase the risk of fatal bleeding. So I feel like it's quite safe in real world circumstances. Um, also, warfarin takes three to five days to get out of your system once you stop that medication, so your blood remains thin for that entire period. Whereas these newer medications are typically out of your system within eight hours. So the newer medications don't need a reversal agent as desperately as Coumadin or Warfarin does. But I will say that the number one reason that patients choose not to take the newer medications by a mile is cost. They're newer, they're still under patent, the out-of-pocket cost for these medications, should your insurance not cover them, is somewhere between <clears throat> excuse me, $400 and $600 per month. So they're very expensive. If you have a plan that doesn't cover them, or if you go into the donut hole for part of the year, that is probably the biggest real-world reason that patients aren't on the newer medications. The um, 2016 European guidelines for AFib is act, have actually bolted the newer medications as first-line therapy for AFib because of the ease of use, decreased risk of bleeding in your brain, and then for some of the medications, superiority over Coumadin. But again, until our insurance policies and things change in the US, I think cost will remain the biggest barrier. So problems with blood thinners. So I have to say, as being an electrophysiologist, that I find blood thinners to be I, one of the most unpopular medications on the market. People, they hear commercials, they, they hate the idea of it. I mean, it is such, I feel that it is really, you have to convince people that it is in their best interest, but there's a lot of sort of bent, a lot of negative bias out there around blood thinners, some of which is deserved. Um, the biggest problems that we face when we have patients with blood thinners or we prescribe them is compliance. Um, about 30% of patients stop taking their blood thinners within two years of being started on a prescription. They just, they end up having some minor bleeding and stop it, they don't like it, they get worried, it's costly, for whatever reason they just stop taking these medications which are meant to be protective. Um, bleeding. Um, this is often called a side effect of the medication. I actually think it's really just an effect of the medication. Blood thinners are meant to do what? Thin your blood. Prevent blood clots from happening. So if you bleed, it will prevent your body's natural reflex from happening, which is that, you know, you cut yourself when you cook, you know that you press and a blood clot forms, and that's what prevents you from bleeding further. 
blood thinners will slow that process down. We would love for blood thinners to work only in your heart, but there's no way for it to do so. So it means that any area in your blood is going, any area that, you know, anywhere you have blood will get affected. What it does not do, though, um, is it does not cause spontaneous bleeding. So I mention that because I feel like that's also a preconception that's out there. A blood thinner does not make you bleed. Can't happen. Can't, I won't be on a blood thinner and suddenly look at my arm and see that it's like dripping blood, right? You have to traumatize it first. Like you have to already be bleeding. And then a blood thinner just makes a little bit of bleeding into more bleeding because it slows your body's ability to stop that bleed. But it doesn't actually cause bleeding. Um, so bleeding is a big problem with blood thinners, obviously, for people prone to bleeding from their stomach, who fall, for other reasons. Um, but we don't like to just simply stop blood thinners in these patients because it turns out that the patient population that's at highest risk for bleeding uh, in a Venn diagram coincides almost completely with the patient population at highest risk for stroke. So your highest risk of bleeding patients, your elderly patients, your patients with a lot of other illnesses, are the same patients who are at the highest risk um, for stroke. And so that ends up becoming a little bit of a problem. Um, do we fear bleeding too much? And I'm just going to get to the short answer, which is yes. We really overestimate the risk of major bleeding. Um, it turns out that fatal bleeds which are most the bleeds that most people care about. You know, if you bleed a little bit from your stomach and you get transfused and you go home the next day, most people don't consider that to be the worst thing in the world. But if you have a fatal bleed or a head bleed where you bang your head and you bleed inside your head because that mimics a stroke, that's very dangerous, the risk of those together is about half a percent per year. So if you think back to our our chart where we said, you know, we, we, we start blood thinners on patients whose risk of stroke annually is over 2%. And, you know, many patients have risks of 5, 6, 7% annually for a stroke. They don't want to be on a blood thinner because they're worried about something that's going to happen at a risk of 0.5% a year. So that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? If you look at that, a lot of patients have, um, don't want to be on a blood thinner when they have a fourfold, tenfold, benefit from it, because a stroke is, as most of us can all agree, devastating. Most of them cannot be reversed, but strokes caused by AFib tend to be very large and disabling. And so when you look at two things, you know, risk benefit is risk and benefit. If the benefit is preventing a stroke and the risk is low, then, you know, looking at the math, it's favorable for most patients, even with this concern. This is just a very busy chart looking at sort of most of these studies with these medications looking at their annual risk of bleeding and, and it hovers around three to two to three percent with the again the fatal bleeds and the head bleeds at a half a percent or less. Another question that I get asked an awful lot is is aspirin good enough? But I'm taking aspirin and it's a blood thinner. Will that work? Probably guess the answer, it's no. An aspirin won't prevent the kind of blood clot that atrial fibrillation causes. It is a good blood thinner for um, small vessel disease, coronary stents, and other types of things, but for the kind of strokes that AFib prevent, uh, causes, it won't prevent them. Um, we find that our older patients are often given an aspirin because they're deemed, quote unquote, too high risk to be on a blood thinner. So, so, so they just give them an aspirin thinking, well, it'll be some protection. Um, in England, about, I would say, six or seven years ago, they did a study, um, it was primary care doctors who did it, and they looked at 1,000 patients who are 75 or older who are often kind of lumped into that, well, they're older, maybe we just give them an aspirin category. Half the patients were randomized to aspirin, and half the patients were randomized to Coumadin, which was the only medication in the market at the time that they did the study. Um, what they found unsurprisingly, was that aspirin didn't really protect against stroke. It was worse protection for strokes. When we know that, we've got many, many trials that say aspirin's not good enough. The interesting part of the study was that these patients who were put on aspirin had an equal amount of bleeds as patients who were on Coumadin. So that seems like a really bad deal. You know, worse protection, same amount of bleeds. So how, why is that? How is that? It, it turns out aspirin it's actually really good at causing bleeding in its own right, or promoting bleeding. It's, it is a blood thinner, and it does, in patients who are older and prone to bleeding, actually promote major bleeds. 
So I think that we have sort of two things happening. These blood thinners, I think, are vilified maybe a little bit unnecessarily. And aspirin is given this halo that it's good for everything, whereas it really can increase your bleeding, risk of bleeding pretty substantially in, the right, in the certain patients. So this is one of our medical charts. We look at data in different ways in these studies. Um, and what this line in the middle is, is this concept of relative risk. So anything, any circle that falls this half of the graph means that blood thinners are better. Any circle that falls in this half of the graph means that aspirin's better. And this is a sub-selection of all the data. They looked at, they sliced it in all sorts of ways. They said, well, what about patients who are 70 to 79, 80 to 84, 80 plus? What about men? What about women? What about if they've been on aspirin before? What if they've been on Coumadin before? What if they have a low risk of stroke? What if they have a high risk of stroke? And in every subcategory, every time they look at this, Coumadin's better. So that's sort of the take home from that study. Now that being said, hopefully I've convinced you that if you need a blood thinner, it really is the right way to go. Um, but there are people who genuinely cannot take a blood thinner. They have recurrent significant bleeding. Um, I have a gentleman who was on a blood thinner, had stomach bleeding after two ulcer bleeds that they couldn't fix. It was somewhere unfixable for him. Um, they just decided to stop the Coumadin, but then he had a major stroke two months later. Fortunately, he recovered most of his neurological function. And after that, he was like, I don't care if I bleed. I will take my Coumadin and I'll just get transfused. So every six weeks he was in the hospital getting a transfusion from the blood he kept losing. So we have patients who are just sort of between a rock and a hard place, you know, if they have a substantial risk for bleeding, which some people do. So some people have re recurrent risk of bleeding. Some people fall a lot. I have a woman who we tried, um, but you know, before we try to evaluate her before and she literally broke her arm and her hip within two months of each other. So some people fall and the risk of trauma is just too high. Um, there are people who have hobbies with a high risk of trauma. They, they're ski instructors, they play football. I have a gentleman um, who goes to the Lesser Antilles six months a year, where apparently we call to the hospitals down there, they don't have a blood bank. He also loves to do woodworking as a hobby. So there are patients where he's never had a bleed, but you can anticipate if he did, he would have a higher risk than normal of a bad event because of where he lives. And so for people who can't take a blood thinner, as you can imagine, the technology is progressing. And there are lots of efforts underway to reduce the risk of a stroke without the need to take a blood thinner. Why? Well, we know that 90% of the blood clots that happen in the heart originate in one particular area in the heart. There's an outpouching of the left atrium, which is the left top chamber, called the appendage. And the thought is, well, if 90% of the blood clots develop in one spot, maybe we could just get rid of that spot. Can we tie it off? Can we block it off? Can we wall it off? Can we eliminate it in some way? And mechanically, through a procedure, eliminate the majority of blood clots that one might be at risk for. Um, of all of this, in the US, there is one um, FDA-approved device on the market um, called the Watchman device. So I just wanted, sometimes uh, a video is worth a thousand words, so I just wanted to show it to you because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, sort of ignore the commercial aspect of this. <laughs> Doesn't look like I have audio. No? All right, I can do the audio. So basically this is the Watchman device. It is a small, you'll see it's about the size of a quarter device. Yeah, I don't know, it's okay. It's a small device that has a very small nitinol, is the type of metal frame. It's springy, it's soft, and it's covered with this fabric, this synthetic fabric. Um, it's delivered through this big uh, delivery tool that we call a sheath. Um, the procedure to put it in is really a minimally invasive procedure. We put essentially what is an IV, 
into the big vein in the top of the leg. Through this IV, we're able to thread up this delivery system. It goes up the major vein and enters the heart. And then we go across in the heart to the, top, the left atrium, the left top chamber. In that atrium, there is this ear-like outpouching that I mentioned called the appendage. That's where most of the blood tends to stagnate. That's where the blood clots usually come from. And the idea is that we deliver this delivery, we deliver this sort of plug type device right there. This might, be, this might not be the patient one that I selected. Either way, we go through a very small membrane between that separates the two compartments. Um, we go into the heart, we deliver that device. Hold on one second. Yeah, this is the, I apologize, I picked the, uh, the more technical video. And now I, Oh, this is AFib the, patients will have a stroke. This is the. But why are they more likely to have a stroke than people without AFib? For patients with AFib, over 90% of stroke causing clots that originate in the heart are formed in a structure called the left atrial appendage, or LAA. Everyone has a left atrial appendage. It is a small pouch that sits off of the left side of your heart. AFib may cause the blood being pumped through your heart to pool in the LAA, where it gets stuck and can form a clot. If that clot escapes and gets into your circulatory system, it can block the blood supply to the brain and may cause a stroke. Today, a number of treatments are available to reduce this risk of stroke. Blood thinners such as warfarin or coumadin have been available for more than 50 years. But blood thinners affect the entire body and may not be well tolerated by everyone. They may have side effects like bruising, nosebleeds, gastrointestinal bleeding, or, more importantly, if the dosage is not properly maintained, an increased risk of hemorrhagic strokes. Plus, some blood thinners like warfarin require going to a clinic for INR checks and may incur out-of-pocket expenses. But there is a new treatment option that eliminates the need for long-term INR checks and the need to take daily prescription blood thinners. The Watchman device is an implant-based alternative to blood thinners such as warfarin. The Watchman implant is designed to permanently seal off the LAA, where blood clots can form. The Watchman implant is about the size of a quarter. The implant does not require open-heart surgery and the device cannot be seen outside of the body. As in a stent procedure, your doctor will guide the Watchman implant via a catheter through a vein in your upper leg and into the left side of your heart. Once there, your doctor will release the implant to seal off your left atrial appendage. The whole procedure typically takes less than one hour. You would then need to stay in the hospital overnight and recovery typically takes about 24 hours. Over time, heart tissue will grow over the Watchman implant and the LAA will be permanently sealed off. In most cases, patients were able to discontinue blood thinners 45 days after their implant. The Watchman implant offers patients with AFib a potentially life-changing stroke risk treatment option, which could free you from the burden of long-term warfarin therapy forever. So yes, that's, like I said, they can do a better job explaining it probably than I can, but that's essentially the um, new technology that's coming. This is the one that's on the market right now. They're gonna be starting FDA trials for a second, but the idea is this, it's blocking off the troublesome area of the heart that's responsible for the vast majority of strokes. So how do we select patients? Um, essentially, we, at this current moment in time, we pick patients who, um, have a good reason for not being on a long-term blood thinner. We don't do it just based on patient preference at this time, but you know, as the, techno the technology is relatively new, it was FDA approved about a year and a half ago. Um, we were the first hospital 
Oh, yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. We were the first hospital in Connecticut to do this. Um, and the experience has been very good. It is exactly as described. We keep people overnight. The procedure is typically less than an hour. Um, and we, all of our patients that we've implanted this in have been able to stop blood thinners after the device is sealed into place, which typically takes about six weeks. Um, so essentially people who are at risk of stroke deemed to be suitable for a very short run of blood thinner for six weeks while the whole thing is healing in place, but have a good reason um, to seek an alternative to a blood thinner. So um, is it safe to live in atrial fibrillation? Uh, the answer is generally yes. We've got multiple trials that have shown that older patients with AFib that doesn't really bother them too much, provided that their heart rate's under good control and that they're um, getting good treatment for stroke prevention, really have not done any better than patients where we try to bring them back to normal rhythm. So when this, these first studies came out, they kept repeating them because nobody believed it. They thought AFib had to be worse. They thought every normal rhythm had to be better. And it turns out that's not true. Um, if you can live with the AFib comfortably, without symptoms, with good heart rate control, and you're protected against a stroke, then we have no data that changing that is going to help you. So for those patients, I call it nature's second best rhythm. Um, we don't know if the same thing is true for yet very young patients or people with impaired heart function. We think that the uh, inefficiency introduced by the atrial fibrillation might not be beneficial for the long term. We also don't know if we cause AFib to go back to um, normal rhythm by an ablation versus medication, if that's true. Because most of these trials were done with trying to get AFib to go away with medication, which we know that medications have side effects that can be detrimental. Um, so if you do have symptoms, though, or if your heart rate is not well controlled despite medical therapy, which we see sometimes, or if your heart function is worsening with the atrial fibrillation, then we know it doesn't really suit your heart very well. Or if you find that you have a lot of symptoms like shortness of breath or your legs are swelling due to bl poor blood flow from the loss of the atrium squeezing, then we try to get you back to normal rhythm. Well, how do we do so? We usually start with medications. Um, if the medica with the medications, we, if your AFib is the kind that's there all the time, we will do something called a cardioversion, which is a small electrical shock just meant to stop the episode of AFib that you're currently in, with a medication on board to prevent the AFib from coming back. <laughs> Um, ablation is a catheter-based procedure, which I'll describe briefly, which is meant to electrically alter the heart to prevent the AFib from happening. So the medications we use are called antiarrhythmic medications. Um, they're used to restore normal rhythm or to prevent the AFib from happening. Um, and they are different and more potent than the medications that we use just to slow the heart rate down when you're in AFib. They're a totally different class of medications. And they're typically prescribed by a cardiologist or an electrophysiologist like myself. Um, the medications, the major limitation with the medications, and this is a graph looking at three different common medications um, and their efficacy over time, is that they're just not as effective as we would like them to be. That's usually the biggest issue with these medications. They do all have side effects that we have to watch out for, but they're not always effective as we need them to be. So um, our most common medications are somewhere in the 35% range effective. Um, there's a middle class of medications that have been developed since this study came out in 2000, which have an efficacy of about 50 to 55%. And amiodarone is our best, most effective medication with an efficacy of around 65 to 70%. So we typically start with a medication. Um, but if the medication fails, as you can see, that it will sometimes, and patients still have symptoms, then we progress to our newer treatments for atrial fibrillation. Um, the newer treatments um, are catheter ablation, which we'll, I'll mention. Um, catheter ablation, like that Watchman procedure that you saw, we use the big vein in the leg. We put catheters up to the heart. And we modify the electricity of the heart. So what do we modify exactly? What are we trying to target? Well. What we're trying to target is the back of the left atrium. That chamber, as I mentioned to you in the very beginning, receives blood from the lungs and gives it to the rest of the body to be shuttled forth. There are four big veins that are the conduits that bring all that blood back from the lungs and connect it and dump it into the heart. Those veins are in the back. This is the back view of the left atrium where the four veins, one, two, three, four, plug into the back of the heart. <coughs> 
Those veins have sleeves of muscle tissue, which is what these striated things are, that anchor them into the back wall. But there's a lot of stretch, and it's a very confusing junction of the heart. Most of the time, the muscle fibers all travel together. But this kind of looks like 87 meets 95. The electrical connection is very confusing. So electrical impulses that come from inside these veins have a propensity rather than to be a single electrical impulse like a blip on a radar, they have a tendency to actually shatter and cause multiple electrical wavefronts and they start the AFib. So that's what starts the storm in 95% of people. It's electricity specifically within one of these four veins that enters the heart and then breaks into multiple tornadoes of electricity. So that's what we target with our procedures. Um, an ablation, as I mentioned, it's a catheter-based treatment through the large vein of the leg. What we do is the tissue causing the arrhythmia is either treated with heat or freezing top technology to stop it from happening. Our ablation catheters, that heat look, kind of look like this. They're soft, they're flexible, and they have a tip at the end to deliver current. Um, this is sort of an animation created just to represent like a single vein and the patch of t heart tissue that it it gets into. So these are the sleeves of, these are the little muscle fibers that go into the vein. And what we do is with the ablation catheter, we would go around the vein to create destruction of that tissue. We're looking to create scar tissue because scar tissue is electrically impenetrable. It doesn't conduct electricity. So once we've created that, then the electrical impulses inside the vein are trapped. They can't get into the heart, so they really can't start the atrial fibrillation. So that's what we try, that's what, the, that's what our goal is with this procedure. Um, as you can see with the previous example, the, the regular ablation catheter, it's kind of like Monet here. You gotta go point by point by point by point to make these four circles to go around each of the four veins that carry blood from the lungs to the heart. Um, so Medtronic, which is a device manufacturing company, developed this technology called cryotherapy. Again, just to give Stanford a minor plug, we were the first um, hospital in Connecticut to have this. But what we do is rather than go around each of these veins, this is one of the veins, two and three and four, so you're looking at really one vein here, is that we put a catheter here, we inflate a balloon, and since the vein is circular and the balloon is circular, it tends to sit snugly in the mouth of that vein, and then we freeze the inside of the balloon by giving liquid nitrous oxide, which is freezing temperature, it's minus 70 degrees. Um, and just like putting your tongue to a cold pole in the winter, what happens is all the tissue touching that frozen balloon will freeze all at the same time. And it creates the injury and the scar tissue that we're looking for. And what we see is the electrical signal inside the vein will disappear when we ablate. Um, how do we navigate within the heart? Well, we have a lot of cool tools in what I do. Um, and what we use is something called three-dimensional electroanatomic mapping, which is a really fancy way of saying all the catheters in the heart have GPS. <laughs> so we triangulate the signal with magnets under the patient's bed, and all of those catheters, as they move in the chamber that we're working in, actually have inform. Keep hitting the wrong button. The catheters are localized by the magnets. That's how GPS works. Um, and then you'll get a map that creates, has both the, anatom the locational information for the catheter superimposed with the electrical signal received from the catheter. And with that, we can make very nice detailed maps of the heart. So this is a map that I made of somebody's left atrium with a valve and the four veins. You can turn it, you can slice it, you can turn it, you can look at it in any way. You can annotate where you've created those cauterizations. And compared to just plain old x-ray, which is down here, it gives us a wealth of detail to navigate within the heart. And we also used one of the catheters that we put up through, um, from the vein in the leg is a miniaturized ultrasound probe. So we do live ultrasound imaging during the procedure as well. Um, and this is the left atrium and the pulmonary vein and a catheter sitting within. So we can see that all as we're doing the procedure. So we have like a 56 inch monitor with the live electrical information, the three dimensional electronic map, the live ultrasound imaging and the x-ray that we look at all at the same time to navigate within the heart. So ablation, we consider to be a good option for anyone still experiencing bothersome symptoms despite good medical treatment of their atrial fibrillation. 
It's not perfect. The success is about 75 to 80 percent for a single re for a single procedure. The reason being is that sometimes you can get 95 percent of AFib is caused by signals from within those veins, but it means five percent of AFib is caused by other signals. So sometimes we have to go back to find a second, another area capable of kickstarting the AFib. Sometimes we have to go back and we find that areas that we've treated haven't scarred, they've healed. Right? Because scar tissue, as you all know from hurting yourselves at one time or another in your life, doesn't happen overnight. Scar tissue takes a while to happen. What we do is we injure the tissue immediately and we rely on it to become scar so that it becomes an electrical barricade. But some areas can heal and sometimes people will need a touch-up procedure to fix that. Um, and new data is coming out where it is shows that it's potentially safe and effective as a first-line therapy for so patients who don't want to take these antiarrhythmic medications that we can just go to an ablation if that's their preference and that the, the safety and efficacy is similar. Um, less state-of-the-art. Yeah. This is a really interesting study that captured my attention and a lot of other people's where they took, it's a very small study by our study measures. We look at 20,000 patient studies frequently. 150 patients who were obese were referred for an ablation due to refractory atrial fibrillation, and they were offered aggressive risk factor modification. Well, what does that mean? Weight loss, exercise programs, sleep apnea, screening and treatment, cutting down alcohol, um, in addition to the ablation. And so two-thirds of people were like, no thanks, I just want the ablation. <laughs> Sounds like hard work. Um, and about a third, percent, a third of people said, okay, let's do it. And what they found was that the people who participated had a three-fold improvement in success rates to manage their AFib compared to those who did not want to participate and relied on the ablation alone. So what that tells us is that we all have to do our parts, right? There's no point in treating AFib if we don't address root causes, if patients don't do you know, what they can to address. So any patient that comes to me, we always talk about all of these things. So I want to do everything we can to maximize you know, your chances for success. Um, so in summary, and sorry, I've gone a couple minutes late. The diagnosis of atrial fibrillation is instrumental, obviously, for its treatment. Every patient with atrial fibrillation needs to be evaluated and protected against a stroke based on their individual risk assessment. Um, and if they are not a suitable candidate for a blood thinner, as I've shown you, we have alternative therapies which are now available. Um, if patients are symptomatic or having AFib, which is causing them problems like heart failure, um, then we proceed to either medications like rhythm medications or an ablation. And just a parting thoughts. Um, is really that the best outcomes from health, as I think my last slide hopefully showed, come from a partnership between patients um, and their physicians. And I thank you all for coming, because obviously you've taken the time on a Wednesday night to come and listen to a talk about atrial fibrillation. So that's just a real involvement uh, in, your, in, your, in your own personal care, which I think really um, speaks well to helping um, solve any problem. Um, and that we need to continue to shift towards cure through prevention, really rather than intervention. And I again, thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. The ablation eliminate the need for both the blood thinner and medication to control on It's a great question. So it turns out the eighth of ablation can eliminate medications that we use to control the AFib. So if you get ablation, you're not having any fib. That 75-80% chance of success means that you would be off of any medication that you're otherwise using to, con to prevent AFib from happening or control the heart rate when you're AFib. It does not get rid of the risk or the need for a blood thinner. Um, still you still need the blood thinner. If you want to get rid of the blood thinner and it's suitable, then the watchman device, something of that nature, is right for you. We think that's because that, um, the amount of AFib, it doesn't really increase. You know, it turns out that six minutes of AFib is enough to increase your risk of stroke. So it is very hard to screen somebody adequately to prevent such a little amount of atrial fibrillation. We think that, that it requires so little because for most patients, their atrium actually changes with age, as I've mentioned, and other kinds of medical conditions, so that it is not the same as it was. It has both the tendency of causing electrical disturbances and blood clots. So we kind of think that the AFib always causes the blood clots, but there's probably a root cause in a lot of patients that we don't address by just getting rid of fixing the electrical part of it. And so we recommend, and the guidelines recommend, continuing blood thinners in all patients based on their individual risk. What's the difference between AFib and a 
Also another good question. Um, I didn't really talk about flutter specifically, but flutter is very similar to atrial fibrillation, but rather than being completely chaotic little tornadoes of electrical currents, the electricity finds one fixed path to short circuit around. It's also, it's very rapid. It causes, say, heart rate issues. It causes, say, blood clot issues. So in most ways, we manage it, the scene. But the ablation of it is a little bit different because we all we need to do is get rid of that fixed circuit. Mm -hmm. Are there any other medications to prevent a fib? I saw you talk about the, um, the blood thinners, but is anything else being used to target the heart that would prevent so um, the rhythm medications, if you have a diagnosis, so I'm going to break it down to two separate questions. I'm not sure which one you're most interested in. If you already have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, then the rhythm medications are what we use to prevent the AFib from happening, to reduce the frequency of the atrial fibrillation. If your question is, like, if you've never had AFib, if there's medications that you can take to prevent developing AFib, um, there's research on that as well. And sometimes we do use... Certain blood thinners, uh, not blood thinners, blood pressure medications we think might have some, prevent, might prevent some of the scarring that causes the AFib in the first place. Um, some cholesterol medications we think may have a similar effect. So they're doing research to kind of look to see upstream of get, getting AFib if there are medications that might delay that from happening. But no other medications that if you have AFib can prevent an attack? No, those are those rhythm medications that I mentioned, the antiarrhythmic drugs that we tried, the amiodarone, there was that slide that showed that we use them, and their major problem is that they're not as effective as we need them to be. Um, so there's six medications in the market, amiodarone, defetilide, sodalol, flaconide, pathenone, um, and maltap. Does the continued cost of blood tests with Coumadin, does that tend to equalize the cost of the drug compared to Eliquis and the other two? And it, you know, I find that this is kind of frustrating for both me and patients because it's so individual based on every person's insurance plan. So the answer is maybe, maybe not. And it really depends on what you pay for copay, what's your deductible, what percentage of your medication is covered. Um, and so I find that that answer differs vastly from patient to patient. So when we're talking about blood thinners, I will often give people like a list of the medications that we might consider and have them call their insurance plan and research it because it, it depends. How about in the case of uh Basic Medicare? Um, basic Medicare doesn't include a prescription plan at all. So you always have to get Part D coverage elsewhere. So if that's the case, out of pocket for the, if you have no prescription plan coverage, but I can guarantee you that the blood test that you get for Coumadin, plus the cost of Coumadin, which is like four cents a pill, is cheaper than paying four to six hundred dollars out of pocket every month. Mm -hmm. uh, risk assessment for the procedure to close off the appendage, mm -hmm. long-term effect? Sir, the, is there a long-term problem, or yes. long-term effect? Both the, I guess both the operation and the recovery period. So, yeah, no, we consider that we, co we quote about a 4% risk, um, 3 to 4% risk for the procedure itself, so the immediate intraoperative, postoperative period for the procedure itself related to bleeding, bruising, device, you know, issues. Um, once you get past the initial few weeks where it's healing, at that point we don't think that there's any long-term problems with the device itself. Um, because it only blocks 90% of the blood clots, I do have a preference in my practice to try to do everything we can to put people on medication first. So look for reversible causes for bleeding, look to see what we can do to minimize the risk of falls, whatever it is. Um, but generally speaking, once the device is implanted, if everything was fine, then we don't expect any long-term issues with it. Mm -hmm. The slide where you showed uh, three of the antiarrhythmic, the efficacy mm -hmm. of the three antiarrhythmic mm -hmm. medications, but I think you just mentioned five. You mentioned fleconide, which wasn't on there. Another one? Yeah, Multic and Dovetilide. So those two, the Multic and the Dovetilide are in that 50 to 55% range. I mentioned there's some newer medications. Those are the two that efficacy studies show that it's about 50 to 55% effective. Flaconide, which was not on that particular study for some reason, is in the same range. As, it's very similar to the propafinone, so it's about 35 to 40 percent. <coughs> Any risk in blood that's left in the appendage if you seal it off? Um, no, it just, 
So originally, basically, once it seals up, it just stays there. It just stays there. It doesn't go bad. It probably clots off, but it, does, it won't go anywhere. It's just walled off at that point. I always say it's like that room in your house that you just you dump everything close in and you close the door. The door. <laughs> it just doesn't exist anymore after that. <laughs> mm -hmm. The procedure that's done through the thigh, I understand there's now a, another procedure that can be done through the wrist. That's actually, an an, that's actually an angiogram. We don't do any of our electrophysiologic studies or ablations or Watchman device through the wrist yet. But in the calf world where they do stents, and look at the arteries, they can't, They mostly do that through the wrist now. But those stents are so little that they, they've, they've shifted over the last 10 years their technique to make it more wrist-based so it's it's easier for people to get out and walk afterwards. Yeah. Okay. What do you say about aerobic exercise? It seems to yeah, it can increase your risk. It's not, let's put it this way, it's not the kind of aerobic exercise I do, you know? It's really high intensity. So it's what we would call people who really have an athletic lifestyle or athletic heart. So people who are really, you know, um, long distance runners, people who do really significant cardio for more than an hour a day are in a special category of risk. Mostly because they, by virtue of all that exercise, actually slow their heart, native heart rate down and make all their, their chambers all dilate. That's what happens to marathon runners. Um, and that stretching out of the atrium actually kind of pulls the electrical system apart a little bit as well, and it can increase your risk of of a fitness plan. Normal exercise, even though no, normal, yeah, this is not an excuse for anybody. <laughs> this is not to say exercise is bad, but it's a very specific category of exercise yeah. that can increase your risk. The slides that you show um, the pictures of the heart show the heart damage. Um, what test is used to show that? What damage? Oh, you mean like the, oh, that's just tissue specimens. So that's not a test that we would normally do. We wouldn't get a tissue specimen. Um, this is a post-transplant data that I showed where they looked at the actual composition of tissue in the heart. 